In our headlines at the SAR, Ukraine and Moldova have been granted European Union candidate status. Pundits say the event is a show of tangible solidarity amid Russia's invasion of Ukraine. President Yoon Suk-yeol has reiterated South Korea's preparedness against any form of North Korean military provocation. His remarks follow reports regarding Pyongyang's intentions to bolster its war deterrence strategy. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization is assessing the global monkeypox situation, exploring the necessity of declaring it a global health emergency. Hello and welcome. You're watching The Daily Report. It's Friday afternoon, June 24th here in capital, Seoul. South Korea is making thorough preparations in response to North Korea's military developments. Now, this is according to President Yoon suk yeol earlier on this Friday. His remarks follow recent reports about North Korea's intentions to change the operational plans and expand the duties of its frontline military units. Ending a three-day party forum this past Thursday, North Korea reportedly approved key defense policies aimed at boosting its war deterrent strategy. There was, however, no mention of a nuclear bomb test, which many pundits believe is imminent. The U.S. defense budget for next year will allow for the current level of U.S. forces in South Korea to be maintained. The country's Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2023 was approved by the House Armed Services Committee on Thursday local time before being handed over to a plenary session of the Senate and House. The bill specified that it will keep U.S. forces in South Korea at 28,500 personnel, the same as this year. It also noted that this level needs to be kept to deter threats aimed at Washington and its allies. There has been a tangible show of solidarity from the European Union to Kyiv as both Ukraine and Moldova have been granted EU candidate status. The Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has also called the event historical. Our Kim Hyosan reports. European leaders have agreed to grant EU candidate status to Ukraine, a symbolic win for the country amid its war with Russia. In what it described as a, quote, historic decision, the 27-member bloc also granted candidate status to neighboring Moldova, while Georgia was told it would get the same once it has fulfilled more conditions. Let me stress that I'm deeply convinced that our decision that we have taken today strengthened us all. It strengthens Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia in the face of Russian aggression. And it strengthens the European Union. It could take Ukraine more than a decade from now to fully join the EU, but the latest decision is a symbolic step that signals the bloc's intention to reach deep into the former Soviet Union. Russia's invasion prompted Ukraine to apply for the status, and the EU was unusually swift in approving it. Nevertheless, the EU leaders did stress that there will be much homework to do going forward. The latest move was endorsed by the Vatican, which expressed regret over the slow progress in reaching peace in the region. Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Parolin also addressed the global food crisis resulting from the Ukraine war, urging that grain exports not be used as a political weapon. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. Meanwhile, the World Health Organization has convened an emergency meeting Thursday to address the necessity of declaring the current monkeypox outbreak a global health emergency. Now, should the declaration be made, monkeypox would be placed in the same category as COVID-19 and polio. An announcement on the matter is not expected before Friday local time. Separately, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has confirmed over 3,300 cases of monkeypox in 42 countries where the virus is not typically found. 80% of those cases were in Europe. The government here is seeking to ensure sustainable pandemic-related financial support. Accordingly, come July 11th, financial aid for those in isolation will only be offered to those who earn below the standard median income. Also, support for paid vacation expenses will now only be granted to workers at companies with fewer than 30 employees. South Korea on this Friday reported 7,227 new cases of COVID-19. 10 people lost their lives and 52 remain in critical condition. In other news, the skyrocketing cost of air travel is looking to put a damper on summer holiday plans beyond national borders. Our Shin Sebyok explains. 
Airports have started to see more travelers wanting to go overseas, taking trips that they had postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm traveling for the first time in a year. I'm very excited. But the excitement of these travelers is dampened by record-breaking fuel surcharges that are making flights more expensive by the day. The flight price for this trip was extremely expensive. I wanted to plan on the trip, but didn't dare to because it was so much. International students leaving for their studies are shocked by return flight prices that are at record high levels. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, a round-trip flight to New York was under 1,000 US dollars, but it is now closer to 2,000 dollars. Flight prices on average have more than doubled. The number of flights at Incheon International Airport is increasing as well as the number of travelers, though airport traffic is still only at roughly one-third of where things were before the pandemic. The recovery rate of international flights is still at 20 percent compared to before COVID-19. We are making full efforts to further expand operations in July to run 162 flights across 34 routes. The slowly increasing number of flights available may not solve the problem. Fuel surcharges are announced by airlines every month, and these have been hitting record highs since February this year. Customers looking to book an international flight for July are looking at fuel surcharges of $33 to $250 for Korean Air flights and $36 to $206 for Asiana Airlines. Industry analysts are not expecting international airfares to return to normal until at least the fourth quarter of this year. Shin Sebyeok, Arirang News. Also on the local front, producer prices hit an all-time high in May, accelerating 9.7% on year. Our Shin Hayoung has the numbers and their implications. People here in South Korea are feeling the high inflation, especially at the grocery store. As a family of five, around 150 US dollars was enough to buy a week's worth of groceries. But prices have been rising so much these days that even $230 is not enough. Consumer prices have been rising so much, especially meat, because of rising producer prices. The Bank of Korea said Thursday that in May, producer prices jumped 9.7%. Month on month, the producer price index in May was up half a percent from April to 119.24, an all-time high. The figure has been rising every month so far this year. The surge was driven by livestock products up by almost 7 percent. The price of pork rose almost 22 percent and eggs were up 5 percent. As an extension of the oil price surge, petroleum products went up by almost 6 percent. A rise in producer prices will generally mean that higher prices are ahead for consumers. With producer prices increasing, consumer prices can also rise. Prices are increasing for necessities, including imported food products and livestock products. This will likely lead to unstable inflation, which has also been driven by the weakening Korean currency. The same day, the Bank of Korea emphasized the need to keep prices in check. Senior Deputy Governor Lee seung hun said the BOK should focus on monetary policy to prevent a rise in inflation expectations, which would make the problem worse. Experts say the continued rise in prices and the Bank of Korea's determination to stop it means the BOK will likely raise rates again next month by another so-called big step of 50 basis point. Shin Ha-young, Arirang News. Right, indeed, food prices have been soaring even higher in recent days, especially amid Russia's war in Ukraine and the resulting repercussions on international order and security. For more, I have Professor Martin Keim at the University of Bonn over in Germany, live on the line. Professor Keim, it's a pleasure to have you with us. I'm pleased to be here. Right, now, Professor, before we delve into our talk, let's first take a moment to listen to remarks by the head of the European Commission and the Russian president himself with regard to soaring food prices. Do take a listen. Today, Russia's artillery is bombarding grain warehouses in Ukraine, deliberately. 
and Russians' warships in the Black Sea are blockading Ukrainian ships full of wheat and sunflower seeds. The consequences of these shameful acts are there for everyone to see. Global wheat prices are skyrocketing, and it's the fragile countries and vulnerable populations that suffer the most. Bread prices in Lebanon have increased by 70%, and food shipments from Odessa could not reach Somalia. And on top of this, Russia is now hoarding its own food exports as a form of blackmail, holding back supplies to increase global prices or trading wheat in exchange for political support. This is using hunger and grain to wield power. Russia. Russia, while ensuring its internal food security, its interior market, is ready to significantly increase its export of food and fertilizers. For example, we are ready to increase supplies of grain to up to 50 million tons. We will prioritize supplies to countries in the direst need of food and where there is the risk of an increase in the number of those starving, namely Africa and Middle East countries. Regarding, and I cannot ignore this topic as there's lots of speculations about it, the Ukrainian food supply, we're not disrupting it for God's sake. Right. Now, that was Mr. Putin this past Friday, Professor, speaking at the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, where he denied Russia's rule in pushing up global food prices. Those remarks, of course, follow earlier accusations by Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission, during a speech at the World Economic Forum, late May that was, during which she claimed Putin was using hunger and grain to wield power. Now, that being said, Professor Kaim, pundits claim that global food prices were hitting record levels even before Russia invaded Ukraine. Do you agree? And if so, how do you explain that? It's true. I mean, even before Russia attacked Ukraine, food prices were at uh, record highs. If you look at uh, the last two years, uh, wheat uh, is usually taken as the commodity uh, that's indicating food prices. Wheat prices uh, in January uh, were about 50% higher than two years earlier. But then with the Russian attack uh, starting on 24 uh, February this year, uh, prices for wheat internationally increased by another 50%. So they're now around 100% higher than they were two years ago. And uh, when you're asking, okay, what are the reasons? I mean, the price increase since February uh, is obviously due to Russia blocking Ukrainian exports. The port of Odessa is blocked by Russian warships and nothing goes out there. And those commodities, uh, wheat, but also oil seeds are now missing. They're lacking at international markets driving prices up. Before that, um, the, the price increases over the last two years, uh, obviously there were uh, other reasons that are still relevant today. There was the COVID-19 pandemic, which isn't over yet. There was, uh, you know, skyrocketing energy prices, which are still uh, ongoing. And there were issues with uh, climate-related uh, harvest failures in some parts of the world. Uh, and uh, that means, uh, you know, you have disruptions. Uh, and unfortunately, with climate change, such types of disruptions and harvest failures uh, are likely uh, to further increase in the future. Right. Then, Professor Kaim, simply speaking, then, Russia's war in Ukraine has been aggravating an already existing global challenge in terms of food prices. Now, that being said, then, how severe is the current situation? I mean, EU officials claim the consequences of blocked food exports from Ukraine can devastate millions worldwide. Do you share this outlook? I definitely share this outlook. I mean, uh, President Putin is using uh, food as a weapon internationally, and I would even go one step further than uh, what EU officials say, because it's always saying there is a looming food crisis in parts of Africa and the Middle East. And uh, I would say, well, we are already in the middle of a food crisis. Just imagine a, a poor family that uh, even before those price increases was hardly able to afford a healthy diet. Uh, because they always uh, already spend, uh, you know, almost all of their income on food. Uh, what is this family going to do when food prices are doubling? I mean, obviously, they have to reduce food consumption. And that's not only grain. It's also the uh, vegetables. It's also the livestock products. It's the fruits. 
And that means obviously more hunger and more uh, undernutrition. And we need not only to talk, we need to act. I mean, there are things that could be done in the short run, uh, apart from uh, obviously putting uh, pressure on, on uh, uh, Putin and helping the Ukraine in terms of uh, maintaining agriculture production and resuming exports. But we need to increase international uh, food aid support uh, for the poorest people and the poorest countries. We need to reduce uh, the use of grain for non-food uses. I mean, a lot is put into biofuels, a lot is put into livestock feeds, uh, and we really need to prioritize now and uh, see that uh, we're uh, avoiding uh, a worst uh, famine um, that uh, may happen uh, later this year. Right. Professor Keim, does this bleak reality perhaps look to affect supermarket shelves over in Europe, do you think? Well, I mean, Europe is a relatively rich region, and so uh, we're not really uh, seeing uh, empty shelves here uh, for lack of availability of food. Uh, obviously, prices uh, also in Europe have increased dramatically, and that makes life uh, more difficult for the poorer population segment, no question. But in Europe, uh, we have relatively well-established uh, social policy systems. So that means uh, the, the uh, harshest social hardships uh, are cushioned uh, by uh, social policies. And that's obviously something that we don't have in poorer countries. And food is still available, even internationally. It's not uh, that it, there's an acute scarcity. It's all a matter of price. But Europe can import whereas the poorer countries can't uh, when prices go so up. And, and whenever we see international prices going up, then not only the poorest countries, but also the poorest people within these countries are those uh, who are hit hardest. Uh, and that's really something we need to have on the radar and we need to act internationally to prevent uh, a famine. Right, and staying with the idea of acting, Professor Kaim, it has been said that food systems are critical components of disaster preparedness and resilience planning. How should countries in Europe, and also here in South Korea, for its part that is, look to strengthen food security, do you think? I mean, in, in richer countries, including uh, South Korea and also most of Europe, uh, I'm not concerned about food security within those countries and regions. Uh, but obviously, we are living on a small planet, and that means uh, also regions such as Europe obviously have to do their contribution to international food supplies. And in Europe, not uh, now in the crisis situation, but in general in Europe over the last few years, uh, we have observed the tendency that, uh, well, we don't need to produce much anymore. Let's take out uh, chemical inputs from farming. Uh, let's uh, move organic. Uh, and that's something that I consider um, problematic and short-sighted because uh, our planet is small. And uh, we're in Europe sitting on fertile land. We have a lot of water and if we are not you know, producing productively, also developing and using new technologies, uh, then obviously we are not uh, acting internationally responsibly. The other um, thing that I'm now observing uh, is that uh, many countries and observers say, ah, okay, uh, dependency on uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, is creating problems, so let's try to be self-sufficient. And that's an issue. I mean, many countries in the world aren't able to really self-sufficiently produce their own food because they're lacking uh, fertile land and water. We need to increase agriculture production in regions like Africa, but that doesn't mean that uh, we need to stop trade. Trade is uh, really, really needed. First of all, because some countries can't produce enough food uh, and, and they have large populations. And secondly, um, wars are not the only risk. Uh, we have climate change. Uh, and uh, just imagine a country where a drought or a flood happens. Uh, and in that country, um, there's no trade. Uh, I mean, obviously, that'll immediately lead to a hunger catastrophe. So we need trade in order to uh, get uh, food from surplus regions to deficit regions efficiently. Right, of course. Beyond food, Professor Kaim, how does the surging cost of fertilizer look to affect us, broadly speaking? That's another concern. I mean, obviously, fertilizer uh, is uh, an important input in farming, and uh, fertilizer prices have gone up uh, even more than grain prices. I mean, we are seeing uh, three to four times higher fertilizer prices uh, than we had about two years ago. 
uh, and that means farmers are reducing the use of fertilizer and that means lower yields uh, and that means uh, lower supply and uh, increasing uh, prices further. And that's a problem that's not going to, away, uh, to go away uh, quickly. The reason that fertilizer prices are so high is that uh, their production is very energy intensive. And it's the energy prices primarily uh, that are driving fertilizer prices, plus the fact uh, that uh, Russia and its ally Belarus are among the largest uh, fertilizer exporters in the world. And those exports are not uh, in, the, uh, in the current situation happening uh, as, uh, as usual. Professor Keim, beyond all this, what more perhaps could you tell us about rising consumer prices in Europe? I mean, inflation is a big concern here in South Korea, in the US and elsewhere. What is it like there in Europe? No, oh, it's, it's a big concern here in Europe as well. And uh, the, the primary concern is really uh, energy, uh, gas and oil in, in Europe and in Germany in particular. We are very dependent uh, on Russian gas and oil. We're now trying to quickly get independent, uh, but just, uh, you know, in the last few days, uh, the gas supplies by Russia have been decreased uh, by about 60%. And that means uh, gas prices are skyrocketing, oil prices are uh, extremely high, uh, and that has knock-on effect. I mean, we see it on food prices, uh, we see it on, on other prices that are uh, energy intensive. Uh, yes, I mean, inflation is a big concern and is not likely to go away within the next uh, two, three years. Uh, so we are living in a situation with uh, super high inflation. Right. And regarding efforts, perhaps, Professor Kaim, to rein in inflation, in the long term, would you say it's uh, perhaps wiser, and that's because I lack a better word for that, would it be wiser to risk in recession over inflation, do you think? You know, in the end, uh, we have a perfect storm of different uh, crises happening. And uh, I believe that uh, we have inflation and, and we may um, also see uh, some level of recession. We need to see politically uh, with the right measures that it's not getting uh, too bad. The problem um, with inflation is we also always need to understand where the inflation is coming from, how it's driven. And uh, one of the main factors at this point is really rising uh, gas and oil prices. And these are also important signals. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily say we need to uh, get the energy prices, uh, gas and oil to levels uh, of last year. We don't because uh, the high prices uh, in the end are signals uh, to consumers uh, to save gas and oil. There are signals to companies to save gas and oil. There are signals uh, to uh, innovation uh, and, and researchers uh, to innovate, uh, develop technologies that can help us uh, to get towards renewable uh, energies. So I think uh, price signals uh, are important also to get to more uh, long-term sustainable development path. Uh, and we need to find the right mixture. The important thing, of course, is we need to uh, look for social hardship because high inflation, uh, poor people are always affected more hardly by high inflation. And that's something where social policies are needed. Right, to protect the vulnerable, of course. All right, Professor Martin Keim at the University of Bonn, thank you very much for your time and for joining us live at this very early I2N. Thank you. Right, well, that ends the first half of our programme. We'll return in a few minutes with the second half. Stay with us.
Welcome back. A law enacted here in the country about a decade ago allows adoptees born here to reinstate their citizenship without losing their adopted nationality. Now, prior to this law, adoptees who happened to have both citizenships had to choose one once they turned 20 or 22, depending on gender. For more on this, I have Brian Peach here in the studio, an adoptee who reclaimed his Korean citizenship recently. Now, Brian, welcome to the program and congratulations on reclaiming your Korean identity. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Right. Brian, your Korean name, Chong Tong Su, right? Did you choose that name? Or? Um, no, it was assigned to me um, possibly at birth, possibly after that. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure who gave me those names. Um, but growing up, I always knew that that was my Korean name, and then I also had my American name. I see. All right, then. Let's begin a bit, then, with the reason for and the journey to reclaiming Korean citizenship, Brian. Um, yeah, so I think there are really two separate reasons. Um, my reason for being in Korea is personal and professional. I'm a reporter at the Washington Post. I moved here in July last year to open up our Seoul newsroom. Um, but also the other half of it is that I was adopted, born here, and uh, went to America when I was nine months. And so Korean citizenship is something that I had when I was a baby. It was I had it up until the age of about two or three. Um, and so when I became an American citizen, um, I was obviously too young to know what was going on at th that age. Um, so my Korean citizenship was renounced to make me an American citizen. And so when I came back, um, I, knew, I always kind of knew of, a lot of adoptees kind of know of Korea or of citizenship as this far off thing. And so when I came here, I knew that it's a lot easier f to get citizenship if you're in Korea and it takes about a year's time. And so I knew I'd be here for that time. And so I moved here in July and then in September, um, I applied for dual citizenship. Right, I see. Are you required to take a Korean language proficiency test to um, reclaim your citizenship? I'm not, and I think I'm one of the few um, kinds of people who do not have to for citizenship here. Do you suppose, Brian, that such a requirement perhaps might have hindered your hopes of reclaiming your citizenship? 100%. I think it really would have. I know some adoptees are able to take the time and resources to study Korean to the point where maybe they could pass that proficiency test. Um, for me, um, Korean language was not really something that I was able to learn in public school back in America. I'm fluent in Spanish, but not in Korean. And so if I were to have had to take that test, I don't think that I would have been able to pass, and I don't think I would have been able to become a citizen here. Right, so I'm assuming you're learning Korean language right now, then? Um, yeah, um, we have a class together than my coworkers and I once a week. I see. Now, this next question, Brian, is something you touched upon in your own coverage for about your experience for the Washington Post. As you're probably aware, military service here in South Korea is mandatory for all abled Korean men. That being said, are you required to serve? Um, no, I'm not. I'm, uh, I think, level five out of six exemption. So I'm not, I think, the full exemption that people with um, physical or mental disabilities may um, be exempt from. But um, so I have to do the annual readiness training. I've been told that it's like tying knots and learning how to put out fires, uh, which as a Boy Scout, I think I should be fine with. But it might be funny when I cannot speak Korean. Um, but yeah, I'm exempt. And I wrote in the piece that. Um, I kind of interpret it as like a mea culpa from the Korean government of, um, I think in recent years, I think there's been a lot of awareness about um, adoption and that it's not all sunshine and roses. And so uh, it's kind of a recognition of, you know, I wasn't here for the first however many years of my life. And so I don't have to kind of give back that service to Korea. Right. Brian, what has been the response to your article to experience of reclaiming Korean citizenship? Yeah, honestly, it's been mixed, um, and I kind of expected that. Um, I think this was one of the first. Um, it's, it's really great that I'm a reporter at The Post because I'm able to get this platform to share my story in a nuanced way. I think a lot of the stories about adoption are focused on um, reuniting with your biological parents, which is, yes, an important story to tell, but also Adoption is so nuanced and it's so unique to every person's experience. And so I was really happy to be able to tell a story, not just of happiness, of being able to come back here and become um, Korean again, or at least kind of try to get towards that point, um, but also kind of talk about um, just the nuances and the complexities of being adopted. And so um, some people were saying in the comments, um, like, oh, you're not grateful enough for your American parents, or like, um, don't your parents feel bad? Um, and, you know, I wrote in the piece, um, I've been, I'm really thankful for my adoption because I was able to, 
to have a loving American family, and I was able to get educated there, and I speak English proficiently. Um, but there's also these other things. I describe my adoption as the original sin of my life. Um, Catholicism, everybody's born with the original sin. That's your original sin. Um, that's just what I was dealt with in life. And so um, going forward, um, it's been nice to kind of address that and also just be able to be here and um, take care of that. Right. Right. What have been perhaps some of the merits as well as perhaps demerits of reclaiming your citizenship? Um, yeah, uh, last week I went to the bank and I was able to change my name from Brian Peach to Chung Dong Su and um, I get more options when I'm buying things online, even as a Korean. Um, Korea does make life really hard for foreigners here, even those part of the Korean diaspora. And so it is nice to have those privileges as a Korean citizen. Um, that said, it's really interesting. Um, being Korean and also being American and having those be two completely separate identities. Um, I'm flying to Vietnam next week on my Korean passport, so my flight is under my Korean name, my hotel is under my American name. And so the hotel was very confused about that. <laughs> because most Korean Americans, they have at least some shared pieces of their names, but I have completely two separate identities. Right. Brian, you mentioned the Global Overseas Adoptees link in your uh, article. It assisted you in your reinstatement process. Could you tell us a bit about this particular entity? Yeah, um, so my understanding is that it's um, a group of ado adoptees who have gotten together and really recognized the need uh, for someone to lobby for adoptees here. Um, and I feel really fortunate that, you know, I'm young and there are people who came before me who put the work in so that I could basically come here on the F4 visa and then a couple months later apply for citizenship, just submit some papers. Goal helped me um, with the English translation and things like that. Um, one of their volunteers came with me to the immigration agency to be able to submit those papers um, and speak Korean and that sort of a thing. Um, and then just, I think like maybe seven months later, I received a text message from the immigration office saying, congratulations, it's now approved. <laughs> I was actually leaving the climbing gym and I thought maybe it was a spam text, but good thing I translated it. Um, yeah, it was a really smooth and easy process thanks to the people at Goal and other adoptees who have really advocated for us and our rights here as Koreans. Right. Meanwhile, back in the U.S., Brian, uh, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Immigration Policy marks its uh, 10th anniversary this year. For the sake of our viewers here in South Korea, could you tell us a bit, very briefly, about this particular policy? Um, yeah, so it's a policy in America um, that basically recognizes that there are children who were brought to the United States um, before they had, through no fault of their own, they were brought there uh, without documents. And so they were living there um, in the government's eyes illegally. And so they were kind of granted the right to stay and work um, without kind of fear um, of that. And, but it's, it's a really difficult process. I mean, it's, there's a long line to get onto it and then you have to renew every few years. And then during the Trump administration, there was a lot of fears that it'd be taken away. And so um, I compared my experience to, um, to the DACA experience because we both come from the experience of being brought to the US through no fault of our own. And I just was really fortunate that when I was a few years old, I was able to get cre uh, American citizenship so easily. Um, and they kind of have to fight every step of the way. Um, and so I compare it um, in that sense. And interestingly, um, Koreans make up a significant portion of DACA recipients in the United States. Right, they do. All right, Brian Peach, Chung Dong Su, thank you so much for making the time to join us here in the studio. Thank you. Do seek frequent shelter from the sun this summer. And this is according to health experts in South Korea and its counterparts in the Northern Hemisphere fight sizzling temperatures. Our Song Yujin reports. More South Koreans are falling victim to scorching heat this year compared to last year. Data from the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency on Friday shows that the number of patients admitted to emergency rooms for heat-related illnesses over the past month was 163. Although no deaths have been reported so far, that's an increase of more than 70 percent from the same period last year. Demographic-wise, those in their 50s and older made up almost half of the tally. In terms of workplace, around half of the patients worked outdoors, such as on farms. 
The largest number of patients reported on a single day was 23 on June 22nd, when temperatures reached around 35 degrees Celsius. Common symptoms of heat-related illnesses such as heat stroke and heat exhaustion include headache, dizziness, muscle spasms, and fatigue. So how can we protect ourselves from the heat? If you feel like it's too hot or that your heart is pounding too fast, you need to find a cool place immediately. You must take regular breaks if you're working at a place with poor ventilation or wearing tight clothes. When working outside when temperatures are high, you should work in pairs so that you can help each other out when feeling sick. But this is not something only South Korea is struggling with. According to the World Health Organization, more than 166,000 people died due to heat waves from 1998 to 2017. But this number is expected to rise further due to climate change. Song Yujin, Arirang News. Data in recent years show more than half of all traffic fatalities were owing to fatigue behind the wheel. Accordingly, one company has come up with a device that seeks to keep drivers awake and alert while on the road. Our Eun Jin tells us how. This is footage from a traffic camera close to a roadblock that's causing a slowdown of traffic. But we see a truck failing to slow down before crashing into the truck ahead, leading to a multiple car pileup. No brake lights suggests the driver's attention was somehow compromised. In cases where trucks swerve across lanes or drive through highway guardrails, drowsy driving is often the cause, which also leads to a higher risk of casualties. According to data from the Korea Expressway Corporation, in 2020 and 2021, the number of deaths caused by motor vehicles came to 350, of which 251 were due to drowsy driving. Technology that could monitor a driver's attentiveness could significantly reduce such accidents. Now, in a world first, Hyundai Mobis has developed a system that monitors the driver's state by measuring their brain waves. The technology uses a sensor that looks like an earphone. Worn on one ear, the driver's level of attention is detected by changes in their brain waves, and the driver is alerted through both the earpiece and their mobile phone. Artificial intelligence learns brainwave signals and patterns. Based on an AI analysis, if the driver is not focused, an alarm or some other function will alert the driver and wake them up. This technology was tested on 60 drivers in the last year. Results show that instances of drowsy driving and careless or negligent driving decreased by up to 30 percent. Driving on the highway for long hours, I do get drowsy. Then there's an alarm that wakes me up. Hyundai Movis plans to expand the testing for this device to 300 bus drivers this year. With more data to feed the AI, the technology can be even more detailed. The company says this device is more advanced than technology used by overseas competitors that monitors changes in the driver's pupils or pulses and hopes to commercialize the earpiece in the next two years. Yoon Jin, Arirang News. And technology has also been incorporated in a newly built military prison to foster a safer and more humane environment behind bars. Our Defence Minister correspondent Pei Yunji was there. For the first time in 37 years, South Korea has built a new military prison. It opened on Thursday in Itcheon, Gyeonggi-do province, after two years of construction that cost more than 15 million US dollars. Unlike the original that was in very poor condition, the new prison has a more pleasant and cleaner environment. Inside, it almost looks like a school dormitory. It even has advanced systems in its solitary confinement cells. Around 50 cells in this newly built military prison are equipped with breathing sensors in the ceiling. They monitor the prisoner's breathing rate to prevent suicide and self-harm. These systems alert prison officers when an inmate starts breathing faster or stops breathing for a certain amount of time. It's also the first correctional facility in the country to have a day room. It's a spacious communal area where inmates can socialize during the daytime and has air purifying plants placed on the walls, aimed at improving mental health. Outside the building, security fences are equipped with AI technology, which sounds an alarm when it detects someone trying to climb over. Access to each building is also closely monitored. You need more than a simple ID card and your fingerprint because a face recognition system identifies anyone coming in and out. 
It's important to create a human rights friendly atmosphere while having a high level of security at the same time. We are able to do both at this new facility. The new prison with a positive but secure environment is expected to help reduce the rate of re-offending once released. Pae eun j i Arirang News. Many say music speaks a language of its own. Well, for one special orchestra, music holds the power to push them beyond their immediate disabilities. My colleague i s h i u has the scenes and sounds to prove that. The Heart Heart Orchestra aims to raise awareness about developmental disabilities through music. Founded in 2006 by the non-profit Heart to Heart Foundation, all of the orchestra's members have developmental disabilities. Their performances have touched many not only in South Korea but around the world. The group of musicians have performed around 1,000 times together, including at New York's Carnegie Hall and Washington, D.C.'s John F. Kennedy Center. And on Tuesday, they showcased a special collaboration at the Gwanglim Arts Center. As the start of what's called a master series, the orchestra invited renowned musicians in South Korea to join them in their dynamic repertoire. Led by conductor An d u h y o n the orchestra was joined by soloists trumpeter Song j e c h a n g soprano Hong Hye-ran, and tenor Choi Won-hui. It took lots of attention, love and passion from many for the orchestra with pure love for music to train and achieve this level. We wanted to be part of such passionate efforts and decided to share our talent and hearts. The members of the orchestra shared their excitement at being able to touch the audience with their music. Oh, I'm very excited and happy. After the pandemic, I realized how happy and grateful I am to receive applause and interact with the audience. It is truly an honor to be able to perform. I am very excited, proud, and joyful. The orchestra performed a total of eight pieces beginning with Mozart's overture from the opera The Magic Flute. The artists also showcased music from Haydn and Beethoven before their spirited final piece, Be Rosette, ended to a standing ovation. There will be three more collaborative efforts for the Master Series concerts throughout this year in September, October, and December. Those interested can register to attend for free in advance at the Heart to Heart Foundation's official Korean website. Yi s i h u Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. A New York state law that required gun owners to get a license to carry their firearms outside has been struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. The ruling came on Thursday in a 6-3 decision. Conservative judges said the requirement to have a proper cause to obtain the unrestricted concealed carry permits violated the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Speaking from the White House, U.S. President Joe Biden voiced dismay at the ruling. I think it's a bad decision. I think it's, I think it's not reasoned accurately, but I'm disappointed. This marks the biggest expansion of gun rights in over a decade by the Supreme Court and may lead to similar laws being struck down in eight other states and the District of Columbia. A court in Paris has convicted eight men over the theft of a Banksy artwork from the Bataclan Concert Hall in January 2019. According to a court spokesperson, seven French citizens and one Italian were handed prison sentences from six months to four years, but will wear an electronic bracelet instead of serving actual jail time. The artwork was a mural painted on an exit door of one of the sites of the November 2015 Paris attacks. It was eventually recovered from a farm in Italy in June 2020. Called Sad Girl, the piece honors those killed in the attacks. It is the second time a Banksy piece has been stolen, as a painting of a rat carrying a suitcase was taken a decade ago from outside a house in the Australian city of Melbourne. American artistic swimmer and two-time Olympic champion Anita Alvarez was rescued by her coach after losing consciousness and almost drowning. Alvarez was at the end of her solo routine at the World Aquatic Championships in Budapest on Wednesday when she sank to the bottom of the pool. 
Her coach, Andrea Fuentes, jumped into the water and lifted Alvarez to the surface, where she received medical attention. A statement from Fuentes later that day said that the athlete has been checked by doctors and is recovering. This is not the first time the coach has rescued Alvarez, who previously lost consciousness at the end of her pairs routine during an Olympic qualification event in Spain last year. Over 15,000 purebred dogs from around the world are taking part in the World Dog Show in Madrid. The multi-day event, which started on Thursday and is set to end on Sunday, makes its return after a two-year COVID-19 hiatus. Featuring breeds such as Dachshunds, the Peruvian hairless dog and many more, the dog show counts 250 of the 400 breeds that are recognized by the International Canine Federation. The event sees the canines compete in front of international referees across 70 rings. This is the third time that Spain has hosted the World Dog Show. It was previously the host in 1983 and 1992. The next World Dog Show is set to take place this December in Brazil's Rio de Janeiro. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Friday afternoon. The rain has nearly died out in Seoul as rain clouds head southward, and all the heavy rain advisories have been lifted. But still, Jeju Island and the south coast are expecting pockets of heavy downpours and strong gusts of up to 20 meters per second on the southeast coast. So take steps to prevent additional damage from downpours and look out for heavy rain warnings and avoid dangerous areas, especially if you live on Jeju Island or near the south coast, as those areas are predicted to be battered by heavy rain above to 150 millimeters and 80 millimeters respectively. And thanks to the rain, the air quality couldn't be better. But now it's quite hot and muggy with heat advisories newly issued in Gyeongsangbuk-do province and coastal areas of Gangwon-do province. While temperatures will ramp up again on the weekend, hitting 30 degrees in Seoul with scattered showers for inland regions. And as we head into the early next week, central areas will have more rain. All have a great weekend, and now let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions. On that note, we say goodbye for this week. Do join us again starting next Monday. Have a great weekend.